Hi, welcome to everyone's favourite segment, Mailbag, the first one for 2017. I'm back. So let's get this one, th uh, let's get straight into it. Thank you very much, Samuel Pack, I think it is. Pack. Um, from the United States of America. So happy new year to everyone. Let's uh, crack into this thing. So yes, um, Mailbag is back. All your usual episodes will be back. Hopefully some new stuff for 2017. We'll see. But we'll uh, start it with a mailbag because it's everyone's favourite segment. <laughs> Alright, what has Samuel sent in? We have a note. Don't want to spoil it. Right. It's dead. Wrapped in plastic. Oh! Cordless telephone. Oh, I think we might have opened it's like in the original box and everything. The GE cordless telephone. Have we opened one of these before? I think we opened a real old one. It was really crusty. Um, so, ah, uh, yeah, those were the days. You can see, yeah, people still, I still got a cordless phone at home, but you know, this is old. Uh, what, what were these old VHF or something? Um, Oh, oh, it's a shocker. It's a Voyager 700 cordless telephone system. Hands up, hands up if you're still using one. Wow, look at these GE advantages. 46, 49 megahertz frequency operations. Lessens the chance of interference with AM broadcasting and reduces power line noise. Long, short range switchable. It's got an anti-piracy feature you can't see in there, but there it is. Oh, that continuously blocks unauthorized long distance calls through your base by other cordless phones. Because that was a big deal back in the day and you could actually listen in to people's uh, phones back in the day. I don't know if any of them still do, but uh, yeah, these analog phones, no worries. And this sucker cost a hundred US bucks back in the late 80s. That was a fair bit of dosh back then. Anyway, um, Samuel has sent this in. He's from Crown Point, Indiana. Hi to all my viewers in Indiana. And of course it has the classic 1980s style in. Look at that. Oh, and we've got ourselves a telescopic rod antenna. Oh, I love playing with the rod antennas. Fantastic. So let's crack open this Bobby Dazzler and see what we've got inside. Ta-da! Exactly what you'd expect. Uh, Single-sided construction. They got away with very few links. Just a couple of links in there. Nice layout job. Oh, lost one. And uh, yeah, we've got our line isolation uh, transformer and some Motorola chippies. Uh, ooh, what is that? Big ass relay, is it? Hmm. But look at this mains wiring, completely how you doing, look, they've just got, oh my, I'm going to have to take that off, but just electrical tape on there, just draped over the board, oh my goodness, and this thing is UL listed, upside down UL, so all the electrons are going to fall out, at least they use a proper crimp, I mean you wouldn't want to be dodgy or anything, would you? And I love this little uh, tweak down here, oh we have to shield the can of the uh, crystal here, and over to the can of the inductor. And we have a date code, 47th week, 85. Yep, that certainly looks and smells like 1985 vintage to me. Good year, 1985. Is this made in Japan? Like, because Marty says all the best stuff's made in Japan. Ah, oh, Korea. Korea was dodgy back then. Now it's like, oh, all the best stuff's made in Korea. South, that is. Nice attention to detail. You've got to stop that TO220 flapping around in the breeze. Thank you very much. And state-of-the-art charging solution on the base station. I mean, we've got a diode and everything. Oh, look at the cute little battery pack. <coughs> and inside the handset, of course, all our uh, wave solder boards here. Now this surface mount rubbish. Got a mod cap bodged on the back there. And uh, see if we can flip it open. There we go. This is interesting. Got ourselves a little bulb there. Little is that a little neon on the output? That's doing some uh, protection. I mean, it's not lighting up uh, for visual um, purposes, but often uh, little neon lamps would be used to uh, provide some overload protection for the antenna or somewhere like that. That's interesting. Maybe it's their attempt to implement some sort of ESD protection, perhaps. Hmm. 
Hmm. Again, they were really paranoid about the uh, crystal cans flapping around in the breeze there, weren't they? There's not a huge amount of other stuff in there. Another... Is that a motor? No, I thought that was a motor. Oh, it's an MC. Don't know if it's a Motorola job. He's single in line uh, packages quite common for the day. That'd be uh, maybe the uh, speaker driver, perhaps. Although, yeah, yeah, it's coming from over here. So that was uh, that was common back in the day to have uh, si uh, SIP package uh, speaker drivers like that. They're still used in like car audio and stuff like that. So that is vintage 1980s tech. Is anyone still using one of these? Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> Thanks, Samuel. Hi to all my Canadian viewers. Uh, this one's going to be interesting, I think. Uh, I like educational type, uh, you know, stuff, educational uh, kits and other things. And this one is from uh, Tron Club. There you go. It's the Tron Club circuit building kit. And um, I'm not sure of the, I can't remember the exact details. They clued me up. They would uh, send me this. And uh, let's have a look. So I'm not sure how it works, uh, whether or not it's a monthly thing, I can't remember. Sorry, but uh, like I got an email that it was being shipped and stuff like that. I think the idea... Welcome, you are now on your way to, uh, on your way to learning circuits by building. It's the best way to learn, by building and failing. I hope it doesn't work. If you get one of these things, I, I, it'd be really good if they made sure it didn't work when you, you know, have a subtle little problem in there. Um, maybe that can be like the advanced ones or something. The advanced kits um, come with a fault built in and you've got to troubleshoot it. That'd be awesome. Anyway, um, oh, I've got an unlock code for the beginner circuit building resistors, capacitors and integrated chips. I've got to go to tronclub.com, log in, I guess, for your online booklet. I guess that saves the trees and all that sort of stuff. That's cool. And um, Hi Dave, we're so excited to be featured in your mailbag segment. Excellent! Exclamation mark. In this package we've included kit number one of the beginners line. I think a lot of your subscribers already are really going to like it. Sure they will. Uh, maybe it'll help them get started back into circuit building. Uh, two lines, it's beginner and advanced. There are two lines, beginner and advanced. Start uh, 12 kits in each line, 22 circuits to build, monthly subscription. Yep, you get a new kit automatically sent to you every month. Cool. Imagine if you build it up and then you're sitting there waiting for the next one to turn up. Um, I wonder if you can uh, trigger them to send a new one. Um, circuits get harder and harder as you move along with the kits, just like the original Tandy slash Radio Shack 201 ships anywhere in the world, flat rate of $25 a month, no extra fees for a kit. $25 a month. Bargain. Bargain. Oh, well, yeah, I won't open it here because you won't even get a battery. Cool, and a little breadboard and everything. Awesome. So this is actually very reasonably priced and they ship out ta -da, this full kit for you and the instructions on the website are very impressive. I'll do a uh, screen capture when I go to um, edit this, but uh, yeah, they're <laughs> ridiculous. Like the um, uh, the diagrams and stuff they've got. Ooh, look, ooh, look, finger condom. We've got, yes, anti-static finger protection. There you go. Just stick it on your finger and, ooh, no, you know, no static when you touch stuff. Um, interesting. Anyway, why they need that, I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah, you get a whole bunch of, um, this first one is for the resistors, uh, capacitors, and integrated chips. They call it integrated circuits, but I don't see any integrated circuits on here unless they count the regulator. Oh no, there we go. Oh, a triple five timer. It's got to be a triple five timer. Anyway, this is, and we've got ourselves a motor and we can spin something. You always got to spin something. It's always interesting. And hook it up to a nine volt battery. Everything's included. And they ship you one of these every month. And it's not just build up one circuit. You build up many different ones with this one resistor capacity kit. And you learn all about stuff. I, this is looking very impressive. And it's, you know, <laughs> Very affordable, 25 bucks a month, almost a bargain. And as it turns out, they just shipped me another one. I just picked this up uh, today, and uh, they do, we've got yet another breadboard, yet another kit. I'm not sure why they have to keep sending the breadboard every time, but uh, this one is the second one for microcontrollers. And so, have they signed me up for a 12 month deal? I'm not sure what's going on there, but this is for an AT Tiny uh, 13 which would be on there, and, well, on there, this is the uh, programmer. So for 25 bucks a month, they ship you 
a kit anywhere in the world. Oh, we got more finger condoms. <laughs> Beautiful. And you get the little jumper links, the proper breadboard jumper links and everything, plus some awesome looking uh, instructions with uh, formulas and all sorts of things. This is a winner winner chicken dinner. So check this out. Once you log in and put the code in and everything, you get access to the uh, booklets. And I've got my uh, two ones, the resistors, capacitors, integrated circuits, and the AT Tiny 13. I won't show you the whole lot because this is their, uh, you know, this is their bread and butter, how they make their money. But here's the lead and the resistor, and it. You know, look, show the photo of the breadboard, clear diagrams, how to wire it up, how to identify your leads and everything and the resistor color code that you get. And it's just, whoa, Ed, we have a video. A circuit example. Oh, it's just going to show you it blinking. I don't think there's... No, there's no audio. They'll just show a little time lapse of putting it together. Oh, isn't that nice? Anyway, beautiful. And here's charging up a capacitor. They give you the formula for uh, capacitors in series and how to identify them once again. But uh, sadly, no oscilloscope shots. I guess they assume that you don't have an oscilloscope or something like that. Maybe in some of the more uh, advanced courses. Flashing the lead with a triple five timer. Would have liked to have seen a bit more uh, detail on the uh, triple five timer. But uh, this is beginner like, well, this is actually kit number one. So I guess, no, you don't. You just want to flash the lead and that's it. And it would have been nice to see, you know, a bit more uh, explanation of, you know, what exactly is the triple five chip, chip. They just say, you know, wire it up and that's it. But it's very impressive documentation, though, apart from that. So just that first kit for the first month, you've actually got 22 different projects. There's the final one right there. And I can leave comments and talk to the other Tron Club members and, and stuff like that. It would have been nice to see, like, you know, some description in there and things like that. But apart from that, this is really nice. It's like a modern version of the uh, Tandy slash Radio Shack, you know, 50 in one, 200 in one. Uh, type kits. I really like it. And as for the uh, microcontroller one, there's a whole bunch of uh, setup stuff here. They take you through step and step by step of setting up the uh, software. And then they've got the pinouts all there. Nice. Look at this. Beautiful. And how to hook up your AT Tiny 13. And you guessed it, blinking the lead. Beauty. There's the code. And once again, just with that second kit there, there's 21 slash 22. Oh, reserved okay they haven't done the photo resistor yet i guess they're still uh, working on it so that's very impressive for their first two kits so the documentation is just uh terrific and it's, i'm sure the, there'll probably be more detailed explanations in the more advanced ones and stuff like that but they've gone to a lot of work here and for each kit each month for your 25 bucks a month it, you get like 21 you know 20 odd 20 plus uh, experiments with it neat It'll keep you going for most of the month, although you could probably wire it up in 10 minutes maybe and get it going, but geez, fun, fun, fun. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Tronclub.com, check it out below. Hi to all my Nicaraguan viewers. I can't say it. Probably outtakes at the end of this video. <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> um, Nicaraguan viewers. Oscar, that, that's reasonably close. Um, I um from Lewis Montoya. Thank you very much, Lewis. Um, it's FedEx, so it's like a commercial. So usually, let's see what we've got from Nicaragua. All right. Um, yeah, I'm gonna. There it is, Stanley knife. No workers. Looks like it might. I'm not sure what's in here, but it looks. Like it's a job for the Stanley knife. Oh! Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, this is cool. I think I was clued up on this one. Didn't know it was from Nicaragua. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, this is a second suck of the salve on the mailbag, but this is a good suck of the salve. Let me show you. And check it out. You've seen this on here before. Oops, upside down. All the electrons are going to fall out. This is from nickadrone.com. I'll link them in down below. That's pretty easy to remember. This is an what's called an electro-permanent magnet. This is version 3 of the open EPM. It's called electro-permanent magnet. What it is, is we've got uh, some ferrous magnets in here. You can probably see them. They're individual strips like that. And then there are uh, magnetic coils under there um, somewhere. I won't take it all apart. Yeah, look, it's all sort of 
welded in. Anyway, um, oh, maybe I will. Hmm. Anyway, the whole idea of this is that uh, you can en you can magnetize these this ferrite these ferrite ferrous magnets. Um, if I'm using the right terminology, uh, so you can turn the magnetism off or on with an electric impulse coming from the thing. So this is designed to go on like the bottom of quadcopters and things like that, and you can trigger the magnet to be off or on, but it doesn't, and this is critical, uh, it does not take any power at all when it's magnet. So it's not an electromagnet, it's an electro-permanent magnet. You just give it the one pulse, you magnetize these, and then it doesn't take any more current at all to magnetize, and then you can give it another pulse, it demagnetizes them, and switches off. So great for carrying loads on something like a quadcopter or a million and one things you can use something like this for. This is awesome. So you can see on here, not a huge amount. We've got a micro there, doesn't matter what it is. We've got ground and uh, five volts. Yeah, five volts in. They supplied a big uh, plug pack with it. And it's got a PWM input as well. I'm not sure uh, that could be the, uh, that could be the PWM input to electro um, magnetize the thing. Anyway, we've got can, is that a CAN bus? Yep, sure enough, I checked and that supports what's called the UAV CAN bus uh, standard, I guess, used in um, unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, there you go, who knew? Learn something new every day here on the EEV log. And so you can either, like it can hook up to the system inside uh, UAVs or uh, just uh, presumably like a separate just trigger input or you've got, looks like a manual push button, which I think the previous one did. I've got a, a, like a power tranny there, probably by the looks of it to uh, generate the uh, high voltage. It's a high voltage uh, type thing. I'm not sure of the exact uh, electro magnet details to magnetize and demagnetize the permanent magnets, but this is a funky, funky product. And I really like the physical construction here. They've got a thin PCB material. What's that? That's not even 0.8. That might be point. Oh, no, that could be 0.8 millimeters or 0.5, whatever. Um, and they've got these tabs here, and they've soldered those in at right angles. I'm sure I've done a video uh, showing that a couple of years back or whatever. But, uh, yeah, that's... That is really quite neat. Whether or not they're functional, yeah, they've got traces on there. They're doing something. It's not just for the labeling. And I can't seem to get uh, these off. So, yeah, I'm not going to be able to show you any further. But anyway, um, high voltage into some electromagnets, which then permanently magnetize those. All right, I've got this hooked up to the 5 volt source. It's going flishy flash, flishy flash. And if I press it, I hear a little little do -do 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 so it's pulsing the magnets and I think I just switched it off yep I just switched it off now watch this no trickery look nothing up my sleeve pulse 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 and now whoa look at that and that uh, I'm having a hard time getting that off oh wow that's impressive has to be real close, but, and if I demagnetize it, listen to this. Hopefully you'll hear it. <laughs> Demagnetized. Magnetized. Sweet. That is absolutely brilliant. So it takes more pulses, more in maybe more energy to demagnetize. I'm not sure. Ah, oh, there's a little bit of residual tiny bit of residual magnetism there but this folks is the duck's guts that is brilliant and it's 59 bucks on nickadrone.com check it out i think i'm gonna like this one the magic smoke department thank you very much um unknown person we've got vintage electronics so has it been smoked yeah i'll probably do some more ev ev smoke episodes Come on, hang on, might require something delicate, no, what do we got, oh yeah, okay, because, um, and uh, please find enclosed some well-aged <laughs> uh, reefer suppression capacitors, uh, the rigour of si uh, sitting 30 years in a part straw has primed them for smoke release, okay, crusty, right, we may have to, <laughs> <laughs> they 
they've just been sitting in, I'll show you a close up. Wow, have they just been sitting in a drawer? Wow, we might have to hook those up to the mains and see if we can smoke them. Not in the lab though. Fire alarm goes off. It cost me about 1500 bucks if that fire alarm goes off. So these are our well-aged reefer suppression capacitors and uh, they've been sitting 30 years in the parts drawer. Oh, let me get in here with the macro lens, which is why you could see the, uh, the fringing around there like that. But uh, these have seen better days. Look, cracks across them. And yes, they are a capacitor and a uh, high frequency um, inductor basically there you go 600 uh, you know nominal 600 ohms um, in series like that and wow these are cracked and just horrible they haven't even been powered up it's just been sitting on the shelf so I'll leave that hopefully for a separate video get the high-speed camera on those and put those straight across the mains because they are 250 volt rated so hmm magic smoke beautiful Next up, got one from Australia. Thank you very much. David S. I think it's David S. from Melbourne. Um, doesn't say anything else, so let's have a crack at it. Um, what's in here? This could be interesting. I've got no clue. Absolutely no clue what this one is. Something went flying. Ta-da! I hope you like the packaging. Enclosed is a object. The packaging is... <laughs> it is full. Absolutely chock up with disposable wrist straps. Um, genuine 3M ones. None of that, uh, none of that eBay Chinese, uh, rubbish. Well, these, um, yeah, uh, you know, they give these away at factories and, uh, you know, stuff like that when, uh, they invite the VIPs in and, you know, um, they give them these disposable wrist straps. So we'll measure one of those. It's just got a, uh, looks like it's got a carbon, um, it's been a long time since I've seen one of these. Yeah, a little carbon inlay. And, yeah, there we go. And uh, that just makes contact. And we'll put that on the ometer and we'll uh, measure it. But, geez, um, I, who wants... A disposable uh, ground in. Oh, that's a no. That's the same, but in a different packet. Let's actually see what the real item is. Anyway, this is the packing material. <laughs> There's something in here. I'm sure it's not just these wrist straps. <clears throat> here we go. Here we go. Crikey, that's a lot of wrist straps. Unbelievable. All right, what do we got? We've got a bit of Cisco kit. Cisco IP phone. Have we done this one before? I think we may have done a Cisco. We've done one or two of these um, IP. To no, they, they were intercoms, weren't they? I don't think they were IP phones. So slightly different. Cool. Two minute teardown. If anyone's got a use for like a hundred disposable uh, wrist straps and you're in Australia, um, two expensive to ship overseas, um, drop me a line. And Dave reckons this thing's actually uh, poorly engineered. 12.9 watts uh, power consumption. That does sound excessive. Wow, for just like an IP, like, geez, you can fly to the moons of Jupiter on 12.9 watts. That's ridiculous. Anyway, um, well, Dave's already <laughs> pre-opened it for our convenience. There we go. Big metal can. Oh, he's already had it. Nope. It's falling apart. What have we got here? Is this some sort of... Uh, uh, oh, okay. They've got a separate um, line interface module here. That makes sense. You could uh, get that, you know, maybe change it for different markets or something like that. Get that uh, compliance on its own just for that board and then everything else on there. If you wanted to make changes for this, it wouldn't uh, matter. And that's going to do uh, power over Ethernet and all the rest of it, because there's your DC uh, jack there, and it comes with a 48-volt plug pack. Um, Cisco have their own processor. ASIC, well, it probably it might just be a rebadged off-the-shelf big uh, arm. Uh, beast. Well, it's a huge BGA. Maybe it's... Uh, maybe, they wouldn't be doing... Would they be doing FPGA? I don't know. Not at 
this, although they are real expensive gear, I was going to say not at this price point, but they are quite expensive. But uh, yeah, not a huge amount inside this thing. And check out the PCB. They've got the classic uh, lands on here just to like leave off the blank space so you don't have to etch away uh, as much copper and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, I, it's like an old school thing. It doesn't really have much relevance these days. It was like back in the old days, it was for board warpage and stuff like that. But um, you know, these days with modern PCB technology, it it doesn't matter. So you know, maybe they've. In in fact, it can be um, a uh, compliance issue because you got all this. Uh, you know, usually you'd ground. You know, you'd have a big ass ground plane on there, but they've no the PCB design has just gone and done the little um, individual floating squares flapping around in the breeze. But meh, as long as it passes compliance, it's fine and dandy. Now, Dave's a big fan of the engineering that goes into this uh, cradle mechanism here, and I kind of agree. It's kind of a little bit groovy. Um, it's got a nice um, hysteresic type snap feel to it. I really like that. And, well, <laughs> well there's your problem right there. So, yeah, but when it's all in the case and everything is being used within its, uh, you know, um, uh, design specs which is like this and then that comes down and you might say well where's the switch where's Wally well there it is in there and oh that's just a tiny little rubber membrane there's, there's it's not like a tactile dome or anything there it is so I I'd like to know the design decision that went into well we're gonna how you engineer that um like I don't know, it seems like a convoluted way to do it, but it, it could be quite elegant in a long-term reliability uh, point of view. Who knows? Anyway, they do have multiple contacts down there on the uh, PCB for that. So, but in the end, it's just a, it's just a membrane switch, but that's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. To be a flyer on the wall in the design review meeting and that one, oh, it's got to flick up and the mechanical engineer comes in and says, oh, no, we, we can do that with one single spring, you know, and it doesn't even have to be a spring. It can just be like a bent bit of spring metal or something like that, and that can flip up. But I don't know. Is that a, a evolutionary thing? evolutionary design thing they went through so many iterations and people said oh slightly unreliable had one fire in you know a hundred thousand after a couple of years and well i don't know but it's, it's, it's interesting hmm speaking of which we can and will power this thing up oh there we go the lights are a flashing um apparently it takes a little bit to uh well, a couple of minutes to power up, which is a complete and utter failure, but it's probably going to, it's probably, you know, some embedded Linux thing or something like that. We'll see if the LCD works. I'm not sure if I've disconnected anything else, but yeah, 48 volt plug pack, um, either the plug pack or the power over ethernet. If you've got a big office infrastructure, you can just uh, power it via or your ethernet cables. You don't need these daggy plug packs hanging around, which are just ugly. Cisco, copyright 2002-2007. Java powered for all you Java fanboys. Oh, I forgot to mention the RF sponge. There we go on the back of that thing, just connecting the uh, metal can. That's a, a conductive uh, sponge, which they've just uh, whacked on with some uh, conductive adhesive there. And that just makes contact for the back. That's for all EMI stuff. And we're in like Flynn. So thanks, Dave, for sending that one in. That's uh, rather interesting. I mean, it's engineered quite well. And as you'd expect, you know, Cisco, Cisco one of the uh, better brands out there on the market. And uh, this is, yeah, 2006 vintage. So it's a decade old, but uh, some, you know, some serious hardware in there to do all this uh, sort of jazz. Maybe, you know, probably a lot simpler these days, a decade uh, later. But yeah, you know, they've done a decent job with that. I like it. So that just provides a low impedance uh, RF path between the module like that, so you don't have to have any extra uh, screws joining those. Next up, one from a company you may have heard of and seen on the mailbag before, Red Patea. Um, uh, they're from uh, Slovenia. Didn't know, I didn't remember that. Anyway, um, they make the Red Patea, um, obviously, and they might be having a second suck of the salve, although I think it sounds like it's something different i haven't been keeping up with what they've been doing but uh, what is it what do we got it's red it's in a 
nice little carry bag. Jeez, I'll, I think I'll save that for the wife. What do you think? <laughs> Here you go, honey. <laughs> Look what I picked you up. Um, is she going to be impressed? I don't know. Let's open it up. Oh, it's got a little bow tie on it. And, oh, let's have a look. Happy New Year 2017 from Red Patea. Thank you very much. And <laughs> I don't think it normally comes packed like that. Oh, that's a funky little case. <laughs> Smells good too. It's got the little Red Patea thing. Yeah, we've done the Red Patea. It's a... um. A uh, um, little, little open source oscilloscopy thingy. Hey, I needed one of these. I need I just, my one. Just uh, decide to spit the dummy. It's a power bank. Um, why red potato are getting into power banks? Um, is it something special or is it just uh, rebranded? Um, red potato. It's just a gift, is it? Could be just a gift. I don't think red potato are getting into. Uh, uh, I can't see. Okay, obviously, you know, it's designed to power their red patea um, separately, but I think, uh, yeah, probably an off the shelf one. Um, five volts in, five volts out, USB. It's a little USB dock. What's the maximum power? It is uh, one amp. That'll do. 2200 milliamp hours. Nice. I needed one. Thank you very much. It's just. Uh, there's no point in doing a teardown. In fact, it looks all potted and everything else. It's just a uh, uh, 2200 milliamp hour lithium ion battery with a probably just a by the looks of the size, just like an 18650 cell with a uh, boost converter. And that's about it. And yep, it works. Um, nothing exciting though. Uh, there's no uh, gauge on it. A little uh, blue lead just comes on and bobs your uncle. Um, anyway, hide all my Slovi Slovenian viewers. Am I saying it correctly? Hi to all my Swedish viewers. This one's not actually a mailbag. It's actually a return. Now, this is from, uh, oh, well, maybe he doesn't want his name um, on there. Anyway, I'll just say that uh, this is from Sweden. It's a return uh, multimeter. So I get, I don't get that many. Um, the fire rate is uh, quite reasonable. Um, I've had maybe, uh, like I sold like almost 2,000 of them. And um, let's have a squeeze. And I think the fire rate's like 1% or something. It's like, it, it's small. We haven't had many um, go wrong. Anyway, um, he says that uh, the low Z mode, the low impedance mode does not work. So it comes on, and of course it's got the uh, low impedance mode, which is a couple of K, um, which, um, which is designed to uh, provide a low impedance. And he says that he's measured that, and it doesn't work. So I'd have a quick squiz at that. Won't be a full troubleshooting video, but uh, we'll have a go. We'll have a peek inside anyway. Sure enough, you power it up, and we're getting uh, 10 megs still on the Auto V Low Z there. But I've never actually uh, measured this on this meter, if we whack in a good one, it's exactly the same. So that's really interesting. I had checked this like at larger voltages and sure enough, look, if I, uh, I've hooked it up to my 30 volt uh, power supply, so I'm measuring now 30 volts and this is the current going into it and sure enough, uh, you know, 10 odd milliamps. So we're talking about a 3K input impedance, which is exactly what you'd uh, expect because there's usually a varista in there, which, you know, it's a few K or something like that. And then, of course, it heats up with uh, uh, higher voltage and increases the resistance and everything else. So it uh, it's not a fixed value, but it changes with the uh, voltage. But it's of that order, you know, a couple of K. So that's actually completely and utterly normal. So if I wind the wick down here, Let's see if it drops off a brick wall, and it does. Look at that. Only at about 10 volts, or let's say, let's call it 8 volts or something, does it start to actually conduct anything. Let's go down to, say, 5 volts. It's, you know, it's 10 microamps. It's bugger all. There you go. So anything below about 5 volts is not enough to trigger it. Boom. There we go. It, well, look at that. There you go, about 8 volts is a trigger point. There you go. Maybe I should update the manual to include that. Oh, I hadn't actually tested that aspect. I just tested it at a higher voltage. That's interesting. 
But if we test another mystery multimeter here in normal volts uh, mode, there you go, you got your 11 meg, turn it to low impedance mode, and just with the multimeter, this is without the power supply, so just the, you know, half a volt that the multimeter's putting out or whatever for the uh, test range, there you go, about 3.5k, so this meter does have the varista directly across the input, so yeah, there must be uh, something, something doing with the Bryman uh, BM235, um, as I said before, they haven't actually provided me the schematic for this, so I'd have to actually reverse engineer the front end to see what's going on there, but there's about an 8 volt threshold. Who knew? So I could have avoided myself a return there by uh, investigating that, but I thought oh, it might have something to do with that solder crack or whatever, um, you know, issue that we had in there, which is now uh, fixed, and, you know, I thought, oh, that's on the front end, maybe there's something to do with that. Uh, perhaps, and yeah, I got it back to have a look at, and sure enough, there's nothing wrong with it. Beauty. Okay, I'm going to do three in a row here. These are all uh, second, third, and fourth sucks of the sav. They might have been sitting here for a while because, uh, yeah, like, you can't have too many sucks of the sav. This one's um, from uh, Schmartboard, uh, Neil Greenberg. So thank you very much, but you have had many sucks of the sav, which is why I haven't opened it sooner. Um, geez, they got lots of stuff. Lots of cool stuff. Smart board RLC divider. Board application. Simulation circuit for LT Spice. Hey, that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, but yeah, they've had many sucks of the sav. Like, <laughs> what are they going to do? Send in every single one of their uh, products to the mailbag? So it looks like Smartboard have gotten into the uh, educational type uh, market. This is an RLC uh, divider board. Yes, it is just literally connectors and stuff like that. They give you uh, the various resistors and uh, caps and stuff in there and jumpers to uh, configure them in various ways. And there you go. They've got... Uh, that's the schematic for it. And you can uh, do various uh, filter configurations and then test them, I guess. Hmm. Okay. And then they provide the associated file for uh, LT Spice. That's rather neat. So we've got a whole bunch of uh, these. This one's for uh, op amp board. So there you go, an OPA uh, 172 op amp. So you can measure. Well, what can we measure? Oh, this is all about LT Spice. And actually, um, instead of just simulating, you can actually give you real circuit examples. There's all the formulas. There's the uh, LT Spice. So you can see how closely it's going to perform to the real thing. Um, this is, that could be really good educational material. I like that, rather than just doing, you know, simulation, bugger that, you know, we've got level shifter stuff, it's a similar sort of thing. Uh, I think all the boards are fairly close to each other, they all just contain, you know, uh, looks like you can put, uh, then we've got surface mount uh, pads on there as well, maybe you can, <laughs> I don't know how you get your soldering iron in there, so I'm not sure what those uh, pads on top are doing, but uh, anyway, I'll link in these smart modules down below. It's kind of interesting concept. Oops, I just opened this one and forgot to press record. I um, thought I was. This one's from an old familiar name, Samuel Ferrero Marquez Lorenco, who's had uh, three, four, five sucks of the sav or something like that. It's another one of... It's a U microcharge, U charge, USB charger module. A quick two second look. A lovely postcard along with it. Beauty. So Samuel has sent in uh, this little USB charger module. If you're in the uh, market, this is all open source. Of course, purple, you know where it uh, comes from. Got the open source symbol. Haven't uh, transitioned to my one yet. I don't think I did my video when he sent this in. Anyway, uh, if you want a um, open source um, USB charger solution, check it out. Link it in down below. Thanks, Samuel. Last but not least, I'm just in the middle of shooting like a Chinese mailbag uh, special, separate video coming soon, and I accidentally um, uh, thought this one was like a bit, it um, was a, just a Chinese eBay thing, but it's not, it's from Max Chen. Chen. Um, hi Max, he's uh, sent in some stuff before, and this one's a um, STM32 uh, demo, uh, uh, development board, let's take a quick squeeze. And Max has uh, set himself some uh, challenges here and came up with this little nice looking Arduino sushi bits. <laughs> I like it, sushi bits. Um, Arduino compatible, of course, you'll re uh, recognize that. But uh, it fits the S STM32, which I've had a look at in a uh, previous video. And maybe we'll do some more on that um, because it's in my... 
maybe. Hmm. Anyway, um, <laughs> here's the yeah first revision of the board. JTAG, uh, broken out the JTAG and boot headers. It's got, um, I like that it's got for ultra low power purposes. A lot of people forget about that sort of uh, stuff. You don't want to piss away the uh, current on a linear regulator and all that. Well, see if you're using a switch mode or whatever. So, you know, it's good that uh, that's been thought of. So anyway, if you want to check it out, and Max is from Shanghai, and yes, P.S. He's open for hire. Are you interested in an 801 compatible MCU designed and made in China? And there's his blog. I'll link it in all down below. You can find his experience. You want to hire Max? Good on you, Max. So thanks to everyone who sent in something for today's mailbag. And I just got another bunch of them today, actually. There's a couple of uh, big ones there we'll check out. So I'll probably do another one shortly. Remember, if you like mailbag, please give it a big thumbs up because that helps with the YouTube metrics. We're all desperate to resubscribe. And don't forget, there's a link down here somewhere. When you go to my um, page, it'll have subscribe. And there's a little uh, bell next to it. You click that and you can get automatic email subscriptions. Um, to when I upload a new video to YouTube because apparently YouTube's been unsubscribing people and all that sort of jazz. Anyway, if it has, for you, if you were subscribed to me and got notifications you're not anymore, let us know in the comments. Have a whinge. Catch you next time.